So uh, welcome everybody, welcome to week three of this mini course. Um, today we're going to talk mostly about uh, things at a more human scale. Um, I did want to say one thing before we get too far on this. Uh, because of the content of today's presentation, there will be a couple of images, maybe a couple of movies that some of you might find disturbing since they do involve uh, impact and humans. Um, so just a fair warning. Um, I don't think there's anything that's too far out of the ordinary, but um, I look at these things all the time and you can get desensitized so, as you do that. So, uh, just so you're aware of that. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, so this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about shocks in the human world. Um, as always, uh, for this kind of work, there's a lot of people involved. Uh, the folks that I have in the pictures down there are people that I have worked with over the last few years uh, in this kind of area. But I'm going to show you images from a community, really. And the community is very large. Um, I'll be uh, crediting them as we go along. Uh, but one thing I want you to get a sense of at this stage, uh, when we get down to the human world, we are transitioning from a community that was mostly physics oriented, um, people with uh, uh, training in physics or engineering uh, into a community that includes uh, folks in biology and medicine, uh, a wider range uh, of experiences, uh, a wider range of uh, a more diverse set of viewpoints. So uh, with that in mind, let's just go ahead and get started. So let's start with the poem again. Uh, this is a, a one line uh, poem from Ralph Waldo Emerson, A Man is a God in Ruins. And I ask you to remember this as we look through the rest of this presentation. So, so let me uh, first take a few minutes to recall what we did in the last session, just trying to make a connection. So if you remember in the very first class, we talked about shocks and we identified the two characteristics of a shock that we needed to think about, the jump associated with the arrival of the shock and the fact that it's a propagating shock. So there's a wave that propagates. Uh, and that the causes of shocks were either extreme events or instabilities. Almost everything we talked about last week when we were talking about planetary impact was due to an extreme event. So those were the jumps associated with planetary impact. And as we saw, uh, you can actually disrupt worlds using such planetary impacts. It's part of the formation of the moon, for example. Today, we are going to shift to thinking mostly about shocks in the human world and the consequence is most of what we're going to think about are really the consequence of instabilities. There are a couple of extreme events, but these are mostly instabilities. The first thing I want to do though in making this bridge from the very large scale, the planetary scale to the human scale is to talk a little bit about time. So you remember that we have a wave, a shock has a jump and a wave. The wave has a wave speed. That wave speed gives you a characteristic velocity in your system. So now if you have a size to your system, that gives you a characteristic a length, a time scale. So to give you an example, if we have a, an asteroid of some sort or a planet that's being impacted. So here's an asteroid that's being impacted. Look at the time scale up here. So let's say I have a, a, the moon, it's 2000 kilometers across. Our wave speed is like five kilometers per second. So that's 400 seconds just to get one way across the moon. So it takes you several minutes for you to realize that one side of the moon got hit if you're on the other side. And for, for the moon to actually get disrupted, you're now talking hours. As the planets, as you think of, uh, about a body that's very large, the time it takes for the event to actually be perceived is also large. It's in the range of hours. Keep that in mind as we shift scales. So now we are going to think about, oops, I've got to go back here, there we go. The Earth, so let's come down from the solar system, think about the Earth itself. This is actually a movie that's created by NASA. It's essentially a series of satellite images that's then uh, projected back onto a sphere and then we're rotating the sphere and you can, you can watch or uh, you can look, for instance, at the temperature changes. You can look at the change in the biology, which is what you're seeing here, where you see growth. Uh, you can see the consequences of temperature. You can see the consequences of sharp gradients uh, coming off the oceans, coming off the land. Uh, so all of that is visible at this scale. This is the space in which we live. And 
we want to go much further down now to this kind of scale. So this is now a city. Now, this is actually a street in San Francisco, I believe. Um, and we're going to think about people. And let's just look at what happens with people. Okay, so let's flip to thinking about this at a much smaller scale. So I want to think about the same kinds of problems. I want to think about shops, but I want to think about it in terms of humans. And more generally, I'm going to think about this in terms of biology, since after all, that's what we are. We are examples of the biological world. I'm going to give you a few examples here that cover a wide range of scales, and then we'll spend most of our time talking about humans or ourselves. So I'm going to show you a series of examples from biology. And here's the first one. This is a woodpecker, something that you guys have all seen and certainly heard uh, at some point. Uh, a woodpecker is a really interesting animal. Uh, obviously, it uh, spends its time making holes in wood. You might think of that as a very small scale impact crater generated with an impact due to its beak. That's what it's doing. Uh, one of the really interesting things about the woodpecker, though, is the fact that it goes through this hammering motion without really affecting its biology. Its brain is not affected by the fact that it's hammering at, I don't know, 20 times per second. It's, it's really pretty fast, or well, maybe three or four times per second. So it's designed to be able to handle that kind of an impact event. On the other hand, we as humans do this. So this is soccer, and uh, we like to head the ball, for instance, in soccer. Um, we decide that this is a sport, but we are going to do this for fun. Um, one of the really interesting things about soccer is it is often viewed as a low contact sport, but in fact, it is a fairly high contact sport, uh, particularly for individuals uh, when they go up for heading. Um, and some of you have probably heard about soccer in terms of concussions and things that you might, things like that that you might get from heading. Uh, but uh, let me point out some other things. So for instance, uh, there is a, a condition called indirect traumatic optic neuropathy, which is a case where you head the ball and some time later, sometimes as much as 30 days later, you go blind in one eye. And that's a consequence of the impact and appears to be related to the stretch of the optic nerve, which is what's connecting your eye to your brain. And so these kinds of impact events can generate damage at uh, levels below. Fortunately, it doesn't happen all the time, which is why most of us play soccer when we're young. But this is an event that occurs, uh, this is a kind of injury that occurs uh, often enough that we study it and uh, it, it's really worth trying to address it. At a much lower scale, this is essentially a blastocyst, that is the very early stage of the development of the human. This is a human blastocyst, so uh, if, you, if you like, uh, just before the embryo uh, has developed into something significant, what you have is this little round ball now you guys remember how fertilization occurs. So you start with a cell, it's been fertilized, it's under the egg, it's been fertilized, it divides, you develop a structure. The really interesting thing about this process is this blastocyst is essentially spherical. It is spherically symmetric. But we are not spherically symmetric. We are bilaterally symmetric. So somehow that spherically symmetric thing becomes a bilaterally symmetric person and the question is, how do you break symmetry? And it turns out this is a process which is essentially an instability. It actually consists of a fracture kind of process. The people who look at this sometimes call it a hydraulic fracture. Uh, as a fra fracture mechanics person, I would tell you it's not really a hydraulic fracture. But really what's happening is an instability where this spherically developing structure breaks into something that's uh, bilaterally symmetric. And that process is a really interesting one. Actually, during that process, you develop some of these uh, shock problems that we're going to talk about later. So three different scales, all of them involving similar events. That's one side. We could think of it in terms of uh, impacts, injuries, uh, development, uh, developmental biology. But shocks can also be really useful in biomedicine. Now, I know I've got several physicians on this uh, call. Uh, calling into this class. And so let me preface this by saying I'm not a physician. Uh, so during the rest of this course, when I talk to you about injury, 
Oh, please don't assume that I'm giving you any medical advice. That said, let's just look at some places where we can use shocks. So this is a classical mechanism now. This is used fairly often. Um, the physicians like to call it extracorporeal shockwave lithotropsy. Um, so the idea is you use a shockwave, you generate a shockwave, and use it to break something like a kidney stone. So here's the kidney stone. You generate the shockwave here, some kind of a focusing mechanism. So you're generating a wave in the fluid. Our bodies are filled with fluid. And then you try to focus it at a particular point. Ideally, you break up the kidney stone without damaging the rest of the healthy tissue around you. That's what you're aiming to do. So um, let me try to minimize this so I can see what I'm doing here. In this kind of a process, you're generating the shock, using it to break the kidney stone. It turns out kidney stones have different strengths depending on how you form the kidney stone. How you form the kidney stone depends on what you eat, it turns out, what you eat and what you drink, suddenly what you drink. Uh, and so you can actually change the ease with which uh, you might break up a kidney stone by changing your diet. And in fact, you'll find that certain cultures are less likely to have kidney stones than others because of the diets that they have, which all comes down to the mechanics associated with these stones uh, that are developed. Uh, so in particular, those of you who come from Indian descent, like I do, uh, if you are a person who eats a lot of uh, food that contains tamarind, you're developing some of these tartrates, which are easier to break up. So that's one. Another, uh, I'm sorry, this is not a very high quality picture, but I took it directly out of the paper. This is an example where you can use the shockwave to try to get through the blood brain barrier. So generally we try to, uh, by all the, 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 uh, the body tries to prevent having things crossing between the blood and the brain. Uh, but sometimes you want to deliver some kind of a drug perhaps, uh, and this becomes hard to do in our traditional ways. It turns out you can use shocks to try to penetrate that barrier. Uh, and a more interesting example is this one. So you can use the shock wave to actually get through a cell membrane. This is now a fairly well established technique. And really people began to do this because of the success of what we had at the extreme left with the shockwave lithotropsy. They said, well, okay, if I can break something up, I can also get into something else. The idea here is you focus your shock and essentially you use it to generate a pore in a cell membrane, and then you can send things through into the cell. You can use that for transfection. You can use that to basically carry genetic material from outside the cell into the cell. And then you can use the cell to have the cell produce more of a particular substance. You can also use it to provide other kinds of drugs. You can use it to send nanoparticles in, which is an example that you see here. Variety of options. Uh, this is actually um, now an area in oncology that people use uh, fairly often. And what they're doing there is using a technique called optoporation, where you take a laser, you use the laser to actually generate a shock in the system. And that shock then results in the development of this uh, uh, penetration of, of the membrane. So here's a useful side of the shock problem. In all of these cases, you'll notice that what you're doing is you're trying to focus the shock into a particular domain so you can activate just one thing, break just one thing, and not damage the rest. So those are the good signs. On the other hand, shocks can also be really bad for you. And I'm going to show you a couple of examples, and this is where some people might feel this, or might be a little squeamish about it. So I'm going to start with this. This is a movie, a video taken this uh, January, I believe. Um, it's probably a date in here somewhere, uh, from at the, in the Daytona uh, races, the Daytona 500. Uh, these, these are races where people drive cars uh, that are fitted out in a very particular way. Uh, and I will ask you to remember the fact that they're fitted out in a particular way as we watch what happens next. So this is Randy Newman, that's the driver. You can certainly view this as an extreme event, and it is. The reason that extreme event developed was an instability as he was driving. And the really interesting thing about this is he survived, actually was not critically injured. And last week, he started racing again, three months later. And the reason he survived is because of the way in which that car is built and the structure that's built around the driver. 
And that structure is designed to take the shocks away from the driver, to protect the driver in the rollover, and to keep the head in with, with some constraint so that you don't have certain motions. So an extreme event resulting from an instability, resulting in another extreme event in terms of the shocks on the individual, and the individual survives. So this is an example of both the fact that people are willing to put themselves at higher risk and the fact that good engineering can really, if you understand uh, the shock problem, really protect people. So that's one. There's actually sound associated with it, but uh, I don't think it's necessary. Here's another. Um, so this is another example of what humans uh, think we are willing to do for fun. This is boxing. Some people do it for fun, some people do it for pay. For those of you who remember the Bob Dylan song, Hurricane, uh, here's an example. Uh, this is Mike Tyson uh, fighting with Buster Douglas in 1990, in February 1990. And this is actually the 10th round of a very difficult fight. So at that point, so this is a legal thing to do apparently. Um, the end result of course is that the boxer is knocked out. So that's an example of a sport where we deliberately hurt each other, oh, but that is really a consequence of a shock and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. Here's one that uh, is an example of um, the other side of things where perhaps uh, certainly you're not trying to hurt yourself. Uh, this is the case of, um, let's see, this is actually the attack by Iran on the American base in Iraq. This is a picture of what was left uh, after that impact, after that attack, uh, several missiles that impacted the base. Uh, you may remember that immediately after the attack, uh, we uh, the news was that no one was uh, critically injured, no one was injured, and sometime later we found that yes, about 35 uh, of our veterans, of our soldiers, were hurt. It was a brain injury for most of them. I believe most of them received the Purple Heart uh, more recently. Uh, but that, this is an example of war, right? A uh, fairly significant event. The fact that people survived is already impressive. Uh, but they were significantly injured uh, through uh, these impacts and these blasts. Speaking of blast, yeah, blast has actually become a weapon of war. It's a really significant weapon, only developed this way in the last uh, 100 years or so. Um, and one of the things you see, so this is a study from the National Academy of Sciences, uh, there are three kinds of blast injury that you get. One is the standard approach where the blast wave is coming in and interacting directly with people you get what's called primary blast injury. Uh, then you get secondary blast injury where something is launched that then penetrates, so impacts directly. And tertiary blast injury where the entire body is thrown away, impacts something else, and then you get injury after that. One of the issues that, ha that, that one has is that typically the person who actually uh, received the injury doesn't remember anything about how it happened. So you have to reconstruct what happened based on whatever data you've got. You almost never have good physical evidence uh, of the event during the event. You only see what the injury is afterwards. And as a consequence of that, what we do is we take our people and we give them equipment that is designed to be protective, that we hope will protect them with respect to these shocks that they're going to see, with respect to these extreme conditions in which they might be, uh, to which they might be subjected. And in this case, for instance, this is a helmet uh, and if you think about the design of a helmet, it's really intended to stop a penetrating, so a shot, right? So this, this is a, an extreme case of design where you've got developed something where it's relatively thin, so there's, you're going to stop a bullet of some sort within a few centimeters from the head. So these are other things that, that happen to us in the human world. And of course, we have the car crash. So let's just walk through the car crash. I'm going to see if I can run the movie here. This is a car that we actually drive. It's a Lexus. It's a Lexus RX 350. 
a side impact at about 30 kilometers or 30 miles per hour. Um, you run this on a sled, that's how you generate the impact. You notice the amount of damage in the car, to the car. In a moment, we will see the top view. Do you see how it skews? And now we will be able to see the driver, actually a dummy, not the driver. You see the two airbags that inflate, the frontal airbag, you can see where the paint comes off from the dummy's face, the side airbag, the fact that the glass of the windshield cracks but doesn't fragment, doesn't go back inside. So this is an example of a successful design against a shock. Um, so the driver is actually protected in that environment. So let's talk for a minute about car crashes. So let's think about a car crash. The first thing to remember is that as a society, we like to move quickly. In fact, if you look at the development of mechanized civilization, it consists of trying to get faster and faster. That's most of what we try to do. You get faster and faster, you've got more and more kinetic energy. Every once in a while you stop, and sometimes you stop too fast and that's a crash. The principle that we follow is that you destroy the car in order to save the driver. So the fact that the car is destroyed is a very good thing for you. If you had a very rigid car, a very strong car which survives, most likely you would not because you are soft. What you're doing here is looking at how waves propagate through your system, through the car and the driver, and how you protect one compared to the other. Typically what you're trying to do is you absorb the energy of the impact. You went to want to send the shocks around the human, not through the human. And you want to spread the stresses out in time. So you want to take the force and distribute it in time. In order to do that, it turns out what's really important is structural design, the shape of the car, the shape of the structure. Even more than the materials design, it's a structural design that matters. And it turns out the most important thing is really the joints. So you join two pieces together, how those joints deform is what determines how you spread the stresses in time, how the shocks move around. And the reason you do all of this is because you're trying to protect the human cargo. And when you design a car, you find you actually make choices about which parts of the human cargo are the most important to protect. In general, you cannot protect the entire driver, the entire human cargo. Depends on the velocity. Get to over 30 miles per hour, it's hard to protect the entire human. The thing you focus on protecting is the brain. Now, these are choices you make. There are codes that help you make those decisions, but it's the brain that dominates them. So with that in mind, let's just think about what people do. So this is one of my favorite pictures. It was taken by a graduate student of mine, Rico Wright, many years ago. At least she's the one who found it for me, who, who, who liked the X Games. So she liked uh, doing some fairly uh, strenuous things. And here's an example where this individual has decided to uh, ride his bike, uh, jump fairly high uh, without a helmet, and he's coming down against concrete. Um, now he's clearly gained a significant amount of kinetic energy, um, sorry, potential energy, since he's high, he's going to convert that to kinetic energy as he comes down. He realizes he's falling, so he's pulling his hands back because he's about to push them forward and try to break the fall. Given the height he's at and the weight he looks like he's got, he's likely to break his wrists. The real question is whether he'll hurt his head. And the answer is he might hurt his head even if he doesn't hit his head on the concrete. Now, the other interesting thing here is that if you look at the people behind him, all of whom are watching him, some of whom would think it's a good thing because they're actually taking a picture of him, um, only one of them is wearing a helmet. So we, when we're young in particular, we tend to put ourselves at significant risk. Uh, this is the kind of thing we see. So the answer to will it hurt is uh, most certainly in this case. Now we do other things with that. We do it in sport. And here we, we realize that there are issues. This is actually what a lot of people talk about when they think about brain injury. Uh, I should tell you that this is kind of an unusual situation, but let's run it through and let's just watch the video. So this is Nebraska against Miami. And the quarterback releases. The receiver is going down. He's got it. And that's the hit. So the Defensive back hits the receiver and not, you notice that the defensive back falls down first. The receiver keeps going, is getting back to his side of the field and then he falls. So he doesn't fall immediately. He thinks he's okay. 
And as he's going across the field, he realizes that he is hurt. It takes him a while. He's already waved across. He knows he's got trouble. And then eventually he falls over. So this is a case where he actually got hit in the head. Um, but it turns out you can get this kind of injury without getting hit in the head. You just have to move the head fast enough. So with that in mind, um, for those of you who don't think about this, let's take a minute to just think about the basic anatomy. Um, so inside your head, you've got your brain, you've got a skull. The brain is separated from the skull by a variety of membranes and by a fluid, which you call the cerebrospinal fluid, sometimes called CSF. The brain itself has multiple parts to it. You've got vasculature, that is blood vessels in the brain. Uh, they're flowing through, helping uh, move the blood through. Remember, we talked about the blood-brain barrier. So you do have that separation. Uh, you also have these spaces in here, like these white areas here, they're called ventricles, and you have fluid flowing through that. If you look at this, the, the, so this is just a section of the brain, the head run through this way. If you look at this from the top and you just look at the brain this way, you see the left and right hemispheres of the brain. Uh, there's actually a membrane that separates the two called the fox. Remember I told you why we are bilaterally symmetric? We are. Of course, if you look at the folds in the brain, that doesn't look quite bilaterally symmetric. So we do have some deviations from that bilateral, or from that bilateral symmetry. But a really important point is we are designed mechanically as a result of evolution to be able to handle motions more easily if they are occurring in that, along that direction of the bilateral symmetry. Now, if you think about how you fall, how you put your hands up, all of that relates to your ability to respond to this kind of uh, symmetry. Your head is designed to be able to protect you under certain conditions. You deviate from those conditions, you're more likely to get injured. But this also relates to how you learn to walk. Uh, your process of learning to walk is basically, a, a, essentially the, the child, when the child is learning to walk, is going through a sequence of controlled falls and eventually learns to manage that and we call that dynamics and you're able to keep moving. So that process is really uh, controlled instability. Your, your, your feedback loop is fast enough that you can maintain control. Okay. But what do we know about the brain itself? And that's what you're trying to protect. So the first thing to recognize about the brain is it is soft. Our brains are fundamentally soft and squishy and a little bit fibrous. And some of you may not like that view, but uh, that, that is the way uh, it feels. Um, that business about being soft and squishy um, means something. So uh, I'm actually going to run the video without the sound. So this is actually a BBC News video that lets you see a piece of the brain. Um, this is a very stiff brain, so he's probably taken it some while uh, after. Um, but there, 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 there's some things to recognize here. It's not very big. It is actually very soft in comparison to most things you're used to handling. It's relatively light, a few pounds. It takes very little power. It's only about 20 watts of power. So if you think about computers, right? Your standard computer, your supercomputer is taking these megawatts of power and you're able to sit there and do better than most supercomputers can with 20 watts. So it's really impressive uh, what our brains can do. But the point about the softness of the brain is because it is soft, that is low stiffness, that means the wave speed in the brain is low. So shock waves move slowly in the brain. It turns out if you try to deform the brain, you get two kinds of waves moving in the brain. You get a pressure wave, which moves fast at about a kilometer per second, and a shear wave, which moves very slowly because the shear stiffness is low at only 10 meters per second. So what that means is when you get hit in the head, the pressure wave moves very quickly through the head and equilibrates, balances out the forces. The shear wave moves very slowly. So you can actually see this if you watch a, a a uh, cadaver, for instance, set near a blast, what you'll see is when the, wave, the blast wave comes by and the, sho the shock wave and then the blast wave comes by, the head barely moves when the blast wave comes through. But sometime later, you will see the head snap back and come forward. That is, the, the neck, which is the boundary condition, makes that motion. That takes some time. That's because of the shear. Most of the time, you are injured more easily by the shear, by the rotation. And just to get a sense of scale here, remember we started with planets and we're coming down. Your brain is down in the, I don't know, 10, 20 centimeter kind of scale. That's the size of your head, ballpark. 
Inside the brain, you've got tissue. That's down at the millimeter kind of scale. You look inside the tissue, mostly neurons and axons. You have these cells with these long uh, fibers that we call axons. If you think about the problem, when you get hit in the head or when you fall over or you're an older person and you fall down the steps, um, you find that your injury is, the, the impact occurs at the head scale, but the injury occurs down at the single cell scale. And the effects of the injury then come back up to the head scale into your behavior and you watch how your behavior evolves. Um, so impact is cascading down the scales and the injury is cascading up the scales. That's how you have to think about it. So even though the impact is occurring at the head scale, we have to worry about what's happening down at the cellular scale. A big problem is we can't do experiments in this domain, right? We can't do live human experiments where we take the, the individual to injury. That actually was done during the Second World War, it turns out, but we of course don't do that. Um, and there are no good animal models to use as substitutes. We use pigs, we use mice. They're all different than we are, particularly in the shape of the skull. All right, so what do we do? We go back to poetry first. So this is Emily Dickinson. The poem is called Crumbling. Let me read it to you. Crumbling is not an instance act, a fundamental pause. Dilapidation's processes are organized decays. It is first a cobweb of the soul, a cuticle of dust, a borrow in the axis, an elemental rust. Ruin is formal, devil's work, consecutive and slow. Fail in an instant, no man did. Slipping is Crash's law. This process of initial impact and then the instabilities that follow, that's really what the story of the injury of your brain. So what you actually do, because you can't do live human experiments, is you say, well, we already have them and they're called sports. So uh, for example, we have, uh, I don't know if this movie's going to run, let me see. Oh, there we go. This is Le'Veon Bell, Pittsburgh Steeler, during a game in which I believe the Steelers beat the Ravens. Um, boy, I forget. Oh, but he was injured significantly during that event. And you can see how the head moves. You've got something like uh, 21 video cameras tracking uh, the motion. You can actually calculate how much, how the brain moved or how the head moved rather. And then if you have a model for the brain, you can then compute what's going to happen inside the brain. And based on that, if you know, and here you wave your hands a great deal, if you know something about where you think the injury might occur, you might say something about how behavior might change and you might see if you can connect the two. You notice that you get increasingly away from things you can do quantitatively and easily. But that's pretty much all you can do with respect to really analyzing brain injury. As much data as you can collect will help you with making those kinds of decisions. So here's what we actually do to generate that brain model. So you take your uh, human volunteer, you get MRI imaging, basically a kind of imaging that lets you see inside the soft tissue. You can then segment those images, figure out what different parts of the brain are. You can do something called diffusion imaging, which allows you to see the fiber directions in the brain. The colors here are showing you fiber directions. And then you can put those together to build a model for the, the whole head. That includes the fiber directions and the individual segments. You can do, do this down to the millimeter cube kind of scale. And you can actually do this for individual humans. So what we do is we basically take live human volunteers in an MRI. We do relatively slow motions. We first get structural information on the head, just like I just showed you. We build a model for each human volunteer, for each specific individual. And then we ask them to do this experiment. They're sitting in the MRI and they turn their head suddenly. They control it. And while they're doing that, uh, with our colleagues over at NIH and Wash, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. We image what's happening in the brain. This is Jerry Prince's work, really. And that's what you see. You can get three-dimensional, internal, in-situ deformation of the brain. And you can measure it. And you can see how it changes as a function of time. This is now milliseconds. Remember, you blink once every 30 milliseconds. This is two blinks. Okay, so that's what you can measure. And then you can build a model for this. So you've got these anatomical scans, which lets you see the structure. So you know the MRI, the DTI, you know what structure you've got. You then have build a model for the head. You have the biomechanical scan that is during the motion, you make measurement. 
and then you run the experiment, and then you calculate what happens in that individual's brain, and you see the waves move. There's a wave propagating inside the brain as a consequence of this very slow motion, most definitely not causing impact, and not causing injury, but you see the waves move already. And if you go look a little more carefully, this is what you see. So let me see if I can run the movie. These are shear waves moving in the brain. And the picture on the right is showing you, so the columns are different times in milliseconds. The rows are different sections of the head. And you can compare what we see in the simulation, in the calculation, with what we see in the experiment. And you can do reasonably well. This is actually how you decide that your calculation is reasonably good. So you're doing a calculation that you check in a non-injurious domain. Then you say, okay, now let me take the same calculation and imagine we have the football player or somebody else going through a very large uh, acceleration and we ask, will they be injured? And where will they be injured? And then we look at what the, the resulting uh, injury is likely to be. So that's pretty much the process we have to do to get into understanding what's happening with the brain. So let me build this back up and try to give you a big picture view. So what I'm going to show you here is a movie of different parts of the brain built for one particular individual, one of our volunteers, as we run through the process. So what you're seeing here in blue are the ventricles in the brain. This is the space that the cerebral spinal fluid works. There's basically part of the brain down the lower part here, then the white matter and the gray matter coming on top. Uh, in a moment, you will see now we can start segmenting. There's the brainstem. Uh, then we'll add the vasculature so you can get at least some of the blood vessels. It's hard to get all of the blood vessels uh, at the same time as you're doing the rest of the brain. But you have that structure. You know what it is for a given individual. You can put that into a model. You have properties for the materials in each domain. And then you can calculate what what's likely to happen to that individual. So that's our basic process when you don't have the ability to do the formal experiment. But being able to run the calculation to understand how the waves propagate in the brain is the dominant term here. All right, I'm going to try to wrap up here with sort of a big picture statement. So let's go back to this big picture argument of the brain impact problem. So what, in the impact problem, the particular one we chose to study here was the brain impact. Obviously, we could have looked at the, or we could have looked at other things. We could have looked at the cell or fragmentation problem, or the, the uh, little tripsy problem, a variety of things, but we chose this one. So one of the things that uh, one of my colleagues, uh, who's a physician uh, in the med school told me uh, when we were first starting out on this, trying to decide what to work on, was he said, look, if we can see it in radiology, we know how to fix it. So spend your time thinking about the things that we can't see in radiology. So typically that's this kind of injury, sort of a deep brain injury, kinds of things you might see in concussions, not easy to see in standard radiology. It turns out that rotational accelerations dominate for that kind of behavior, for that kind of failure. So how fast you move your head, this is the reason why boxers know that certain kinds of punches are really effective. There's both an impact and an acceleration. Um, you're looking at both of those domains. Modeling tells us that some kinds of rotation are much worse for us than others, but the boxers already knew some of that. If you remember Mike. The NASCAR example, the Daytona 500, for example, tells you that if you build the cage correctly to constrain the motion of the driver, and particularly the motion of the head, you can really protect the individual. One of our problems, of course, is in our standard, my car out in the garage, uh, I don't like to have all of that constraint around me. And so, of course, I'm a little more exposed. On the other hand, with luck, I don't drive in a domain as risky as the of the data of the 500. One of the big problems we have though is that we're doing impact dynamics, shock waves, 30 milliseconds, 50 milliseconds. All of the interesting biochemistry is happening much later. All of the interesting responses, the healing, the drug treatments, all of that takes much more time. So we've got a difference in time scale here between the impact problem, the shock problem, and the healing problem, where you've got to diffuse chemicals through the system. And diffusion takes a long time. We haven't yet figured that out. We need a way of collecting these different time scales. And sort of, you know, general way for us, we really should be able to take advantage of the data sets that are now available in neuroscience. 
like a picture here from the Connectome project, uh, for instance, to give you an example. So you can see uh, what the fiber orientations are, and maybe use that in more detail. You know what the connections are. Maybe you can say something about injury mechanisms from that. So there's sort of the classic question of whether you really get injured if just one fiber breaks, or do you need an essentially failure of the network in order for you to have significant injury? All right, so that's sort of the, the big picture background here. So that's the story. Uh, we've come down from a very large scale to a very small scale, and I've tried to bring it all down into your head, into what's happening in your head, and what could happen in your head, and maybe what should happen in your head. Next week, we're going to shift, come back up somewhat to the scale of thinking about the interactions of humans, the scale of society, and we look at the arts in society, and to some degree, history. So that's, that's where we're going, uh, pulling back up and thinking about much larger scales and really much longer times. We're going to think thousands of years uh, so that we can understand what happens uh, with respect to society. Thank you all for listening. Uh, I know uh, for some of you, uh, some of the material in here might be uh, difficult, uh, but uh, thank you for staying with me. And uh, I hope to see you next week where we'll uh, try to go up and scale and be, maybe be a little more speculative because we don't have real data. Thanks. Bye-bye. Okay.